Thanks, Tony. One of those rare things we've done. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much. Thanks, Tony. Um, so the, this is an ARC project, and the point of this ARC project is to try to bring about some kind of consensus or find common ground for both Liberals and Conservatives on enhancement. Is that, is that correct? So <laughs> what I've done together with uh, my, my co-authors, Johnny Pugh and Guy Kahane, is, is try to find uh, an objection that Conservatives have given to enhancement that we feel we can find common ground on. And, and interestingly, the, the two writers that we've chosen are not normally thought of as conservatives. One is Bernard Williams, one of the most famous moral philosophers of the last 50 years. And the other one is Jerry Cohen, uh, a leftist uh, political philosopher. Um, but both of these writers um, gave talks and had published drafts of papers that engaged with enhancement uh, towards the end of their lives. Um, and, and actually, neither of these papers was published during their lives. It, it was, they were, both of them were published posthumously. But I think it, it shows that they were beginning to engage with the sort of march of enhancement and, and indeed had quite conservative views about it. And we, what we've tried to do in this paper is find what's plausible in their view and, and how it bears on the enhancement debate. How, how many of you are students or postdocs? Okay, well, I mean, just a short note as a sort of strategy. I wish I'd done this in my career. Um, Sid Block said, oh, you know, you're a crusader. Um, I'm not a crusader, but this is actually not a sort of standard paper where I'll give you sort of my view and the most sort of extreme argument for it. This is taking two people who are much smarter than me, much better philosophers, much more famous, and, and looking at their view and finding some area of, of slight weakness and, and then adopting a constructive approach to it and developing your account on the back end. This is a way to get published and, and to sort of rise to the top. And, and the other way to, to, to sort of get easy papers is to connect two debates. So what we're doing here is connecting debate about enhancement and debate about partiality and putting them together. So again, that's an easy strategy. So this is a sort of workmanlike paper, so it's not going to be very exciting. Um, so the, the summary of the paper is that, as I said, Johnny Pugh and, and Guy and I consider a strategy for justifying bioconservative opposition to enhancement, according to which we should resist radical departures from human nature, not because human nature possesses some intrinsic value, but because it's our nature. The idea is that we can be partial to humanity in the same way that common sense morality allows us to be partial to ourselves our family, lovers, friends, or country. Whilst a similar idea was suggested by Bernard Williams and Jerry Cohen, it was not fully developed, and their arguments failed to mount a serious challenge to many forms of enhancement. We explore a better approach drawing on recent literature on the nature and grounds of partiality and attempt to elucidate what partiality for humanity might plausibly involve. However, we argue that even if such partiality for humanity is defensible, it can at most set limits on enhancement. So now some sort of summary of Williams and Cohen and, and their work. The human prejudice, conservative valuing and human enhancement. Both Bernard Williams and Jerry Cohen have defended the claim that the fact that we are human beings gives rise to certain sorts of moral reasons. Williams claims that the fact that we are human beings gives us reason, and in fact the, his paper, his talk was titled Human Prejudice, where he actually attacks Peter Singer and people who defend this view that what matters is not being a human being or being a member of the species Homo sapiens, but being a person. So he's defending the idea that simply being a member of the species Homo sapiens gives us certain sorts of reasons. So William starts his defence of this human prejudice, as he calls it, by observing that it's possible to trace a humanist tradition throughout history that is based on the fundamental assumption that, quote, in cosmic terms, human beings had a definite measure of importance, unquote. However, Williams uh, himself rejects this tradition in view of the fact that it relies on there being a cosmic point of view, or typically a religious point of view or more prosaically, on there being a way in which things can matter absolutely in the universe. While, whilst Williams denies the existence of a cosmic point of view, he goes on to highlight that this does not entail there is no point of view from which human beings are important. 
He writes, and this is a longish quote, there is certainly one point of view from which they are important, namely ours, unsurprisingly so, since the we in question, the we who raise this question and discuss with others, who we hope will listen and reply, are indeed human beings. It is just as unsurprising that this we often shows up within the content of our values. Whether a creature is a human being or not makes a large difference, a lot of the time, to the ways in which we treat that creature or at least think that we should treat it. So on this view, human beings are not understood to have importance in some cosmic absolute sense. Rather, they simply have importance for human beings. That's essentially Williams' view. Williams seems to believe that the mere fact that a creature is a human being can operate as a foundational moral reason to privilege that creature in our moral deliberations. When a foundational moral reason is understood to refer to a reason that neither admits of or requires further justification, it is simply, it is simply something that we care about in a fundamental way. Again, to quote Williams, a central idea involved in the supposed human prejudice which he's defending against Peter, is that there are certain respects in which creatures are treated in one way rather than another simply because they belong to a certain category, the human species. We do not, at this most basic initial level, need to know anything more about them. And this is a key quote. Told that there are human beings trapped in a burning building, on the strength of that fact alone, we mobilise as many resources as we can to rescue them. According to Williams, the foundational nature of the moral reason we have to save human beings in this burning building case suggests that the human prejudice is structurally different from reprehensible prejudices such as racism and sexism. Political philosopher Jerry Cohen has expressed similar ideas, again just prior to his death. Cohen has sought to defend the conservative attitude, which he describes as conservative, of having, quote, a bias in favour of retaining what is of value, even in the face of replacing it by something of greater value. On this attitude, the fact that a bearer of value exists can be understood to confer value to that entity in abstraction from the value that it otherwise bears. Now, this is a complicated notion and somewhat obscure what Cohen means. So just to try to, to, to flesh it out through an example. More specifically, Cohen defends two modes of what he calls conservative valuing, which he terms particular valuing and personal valuing. Now, particular valuing. The object of the value in question is understood to bear intrinsic value. For example, consider some beautiful landmark. He considers All Souls College. But uh, let's consider the Great Pyramid of Giza. By particular valuing, Cohen suggests that the value of the extant particular intrinsically valuable object, that is the pyramid, um, is not exhausted by the intrinsic value which it instantiates. We also value the existing particular object, that is this particular pyramid of Giza, that instantiates that value itself in abstraction from the intrinsic value it bears. To illustrate, Supposedly, suppose that we could undoubtedly replace the Pyramid of Giza with an even greater pyramid on whatever criteria you care to introduce. But we could only do so by destroying the original. Say we had to build the new pyramid on exactly the same site. On Cohen's view, the particular value of the extant original pyramid might give a sufficient reason to refrain from creating a new version even though it would be better. So that's particular valuing. His second concept is personal valuing. In the case of personal valuing, the object of such valuing may bear either very little intrinsic value or even no intrinsic value at all. Rather, the value of the object lies mainly in its specific relationship to the evaluator. To illustrate, suppose that a family had an old dining table that was only just serviceable. Even though the table, scratched and creaky, uh, uneven, may lack intrinsic value, the family might choose to retain the table even though they could easily replace it with a new one 
because of the specific relationship that they have to the table. That is, because of the personal value to them. For instance, the table may have been the scene of memorable discussions or it may have been built by a much-loved departed relative. Although Cohen doesn't himself point this out, we've suggested in another paper that in the case of personal valuing, it seems plausible to claim that the relationship of the evaluator to the, valuable, the valued item, the grounds personal value, is based in a shared personal history to that item. I think he gives the example, or we do, of a wedding dress, a woman's wedding dress. To other people, it's maybe worthless to her. It's highly valuable because of the history of that dress for her. So both particular and personal value can undergird the conservative bias that Cohen seeks to defend with respect to human enhancement. However, it should be acknowledged that Cohen himself concedes this bias is defeasible. If the value of new objects is sufficient um, and that replace the existing value of an existing object can be correct to bring about their new existence. However, in such cases, while the conservative may celebrate the new value that's been created, it's also fitting to lament the loss of the existing value. Now, Cohen makes some remarks that suggest that his views regarding conservatism are congruous with the sentiments expressed by Williams. For instance, Cohen writes that we have reason to maintain human beings as they currently exist because they are, quote, creatures that exhibit a certain form of value. And also, we have an additional reason to do so, which is, quote him, that they are us. Interesting, Cohen makes these claims after describing an example that his views can be readily applied to the enhancement debate. Cohen briefly described, in fact, he gave an example like Russell Powell's this afternoon of somebody who replaces all their fleshy parts with uh, synthetic parts, and, and Cohen finds this abhorrent. So this is again to quote Cohen. If I want us to continue as we are, do I want us to retain our negative features? What if genetic manipulation could eliminate envy? I would not want to eliminate all of our bad features. I conjecture that this is partly because the negative traits are part of the package that makes human beings the, particularly, the particular valuable creatures that we personally cherish. And we therefore and are therefore worth preserving as a part of that package. Cohen then suggests that his examples um, suggest that particular and personal modes of valuing delineated before correspond to the distinction between, quote, the reason to preserve human beings, that they are creatures that exhibit a certain form of value, and our additional reason to do so, which is that they are us. Very similar again to Williams. One reason that Cohen highlights particularly echoes Williams' own claims about the human prejudice. In his concluding remarks, Williams claims, hopes for self-improvement can lie dangerously close to the risk of self-hatred. The self-hatred in this case is hatred of humanity. For Williams then to seek to improve human beings in ways that amount to eradicating inherent flaws is to risk expressing a hatred of humanity. For Cohen, though, the reason to preserve human beings, quote, because they are us, unquote, is not strictly foundational, but rather should be understood to correspond to an act of personal valuing. As I've explained, on Cohen's account, the value involved in personal value is grounded by the evaluator's relationship or shared personal history. So in this in, with this in mind, we've suggested elsewhere that there are two ways in which one might argue in favour of preserving human beings as they are by appealing to Cohen's concept of personal value. On the individual level, it seems plausible to claim that we each have a relationship to our own features that may be understood as a basis for each of us placing personal value on ourselves, even if they could be replaced by better parts. However, to broaden the scope of the argument beyond the individual to the collective level, one would also have to claim that the humans as a species have developed their shared characteristics over the course of a shared biological history. One might then argue that to seek to improve ourselves as a species by using enhancement would fail to recognise the significance of our collective relationship to our own shared biological history and the personal value that we, as a collective, place on it. Now this argument is not without its own limitations. Um, we've argued that Cohen's arguments against conservatism or in favour of conservatism can't ground a strong sweeping objection to enhancement. 
One reason for this is that by Cohen's own light, the conservative bias is defeasible. Furthermore, many attractive enhancements, and we give the example of life extending enhancements, can be understood as potentially preserving valuable features of human beings in a manner that is compatible with this conservative bias. Indeed, it seems that similar arguments can plausibly be raised against the scope of an objection based on Williams' defence of the human prejudice. As we claimed in our analysis of the application of Cohen's conservatism to enhancement, quote, this is us in another paper, in seeking to change certain aspects of human nature through the use of enhancement technology, it seems more accurate to say that we are seeking to improve human nature rather than simply replace it wholesale. It's not clear why merely seeking to improve ourselves must indicate a hatred of what we now are. The limited scope of the objections to enhancement that can be grounded by Williams and Cohen's arguments is not their only flaw. Another problem is that the strength of these objections is dependent on the plausibility of their accounts of the human prejudice and conservative modes of valuing. Yet it seems there are problems with both accounts. First, Cohen himself concluded that his account faces many objections. In particular, it's not clear if Cohen's conservatism is not simply a manifestation of status quo bias. Furthermore, um, I've argued in a piece published in about 2002 um, that despite his claims to the contrary, Williams fails to establish that his human prejudice is morally distinct from other morally deplorable prejudices such as racism and sexism. That piece also includes a defence of what I call personism, the view that what matters is being persons, not human beings, that Williams attacks. Now, rather than attempt to supplement or develop Williams and Cohen's accounts, we want to look at recent debates in partiality and see whether these could be used to elaborate this style of account. So partiality, a reason of partiality is, is a distinctive kind of moral reason that has its source in a non-instrumentally valued attachment. In the absence of the attachment in question, the reasons wouldn't obtain. Common sense suggests that it can be permissible for agents to incorporate reasons of partiality in their moral deliberations. To illustrate, suppose that you are told you have only enough time to save either two people who are drowning on the left side of a pier or one person drowning on the right. If you are told that the one person drowning on the right is your brother or your husband or your wife or your child, this fact might plausibly be understood to make it permissible for you to save him or her rather than the two strangers, even though we would normally claim that you have an obligation to save two people rather than one, other things being equal. In view of, the, in view of this apparent prerogative for partiality, we might claim that we can have defeasible reasons of partiality to favour our friends and family in our moral deliberations. Whilst this may seem intuitively plausible, it raises the question of why certain relationships, projects and groups um, can plausibly generate reasons of partiality while others cannot. In the case of family and close friends, this question does not seem to be overly problematic. Um, the close ties that we have forged with these individuals may easily be understood to give rise to non-instrumentally valuable relationships and this sort of value can ground reasonable partiality. However, the question is more problematic when we consider, consider partiality to groups of members to which we belong, because we often lack close ties to all members of the groups to which we belong. For instance, even if we believe that co-nationality can ground reasonable partiality, it's clearly not the case that we have close individual ties with every co-national of ours that exists. Furthermore, we surely cannot be morally justified in being partial to members um, of our own sex or race in our moral deliberations. To illustrate, it would be no moral justification if you're saving the one instead of the two that they were the same sex or the same race as you. This would be discriminatory partiality. So in order to avoid discriminatory partiality, it seems that one must claim that partiality is only morally justifiable towards attachments that are in some way valuable. For instance, John Cottingham suggests that morally justifiable partialities are those in which a plausible case can be made for claiming that the partiality in question must find a place in all or most plausible blueprints of human flourishing. So we developed this, the 
Scheffler's account and, uh, and other accounts of, of justifying partiality, but I'll pass over this. In order to strengthen this sort of account, one would need to establish that there is a non-contingent relationship between human flourishing and the abandonment of racist and sexist attitudes. On such a view, holding such attitudes would simply be inimical to human flourishing. Alternatively, one could adopt a view with somewhat broader scope by claiming that partialities are justified as long as they are grounded by a relationship that has final value. On such an account, partialities may be justified by, va by valuable relationships that are finally valuable for non-welfare based reasons. I'll leave that and make some remarks at the end. Okay, human enhancement and partiality for, human, for, for humanity. I can now begin to sketch what partiality for humanity might involve and the implications it might have for the enhancement debate. I shall first suggest that an account of partiality for, human, for humanity as being grounded by membership dependent reasons that is, by reasons that flow from our non-instrumentally valuing our membership of the human species or family of man. Whether or not it makes sense to speak of reasonable partiality, in this sense, depends on there being a plausible basis for valuing being human. If not, partiality for humanity may be discriminatory. Williams suggests in his burning building case uh, that this case speaks in favour of the human prejudice. However, I've argued elsewhere that deeper consideration of this case suggests it's not sufficient for establishing the claim that we value human beings per se. To see why, consider an analogue of the claim Williams makes on the basis of his burning building case. Now here's the version. Told that there are permanently unconscious human beings trapped in the burning building, on the strength of that fact we mobilise as many resources as we can to rescue them. This claim has far less intuitive plausibility precisely because the human beings in question are not persons. Similarly, what seems to be doing the moral work in William's original burning building case is the fact that the beings in question are persons and not merely human beings. Consider now two further cases. Case one, a permanently unconscious human being is trapped in a burning building and a benevolent extraterrestrial who exhibits all the capacities associated with personhood is trapped in another. You have time to only save one. I believe you have a moral obligation to save the non-human person in case one. The fact that one of the endangered individuals in case one is a person and the other is not gives us sufficient reason to save the individual at the expense of saving the other. Crucially though, it's not clear that it is best to construe our moral reason here as one of partiality. We can understand the reason um, to be associated with the moral status of the entity. However, not all of our moral reasons are grounded in this way. To see why, consider case two. A human person is trapped in one burning building and a benevolent extraterrestrial exhibits all the same capacities and is a person is trapped in another. You have only time to say one. In this case, it at least seems plausible to claim that one might permissibly choose to, cho to say the human person rather than the non-human person. Suppose that this is so. Assuming this is the case, this example suggests that there may yet be scope for reasonable partiality for humanity uh, that goes beyond the moral reasons that we have to treat persons in certain ways according to their moral status. Case one shows that we have strong moral reasons, as McMahon notes, that derive from consideration of the intrinsic properties of other beings who might be affected by our action. However, in case two, insofar as we might justifiably choose to save the human person rather than the non-human person, the moral reason to do so is not derived from the same set of considerations. Rather, our reason to do so derives from extrinsic relational factors, or what we've been calling a reason of partiality for humanity. Our discussion of Cohen's argument from personal value suggests that one possible argument in favour of the view that our membership of the human species is not instrumentally valuable <coughs> could be formed by appealing to the fact that as a species we have developed shared characteristics, including those that demarcate us as persons rather than non-persons over the course of a shared biological history. In justifying our choice in case two above, we might claim that this relationship between you and the human person is morally relevant, since all else is equal and gives you a sufficient moral reason to save the human person rather than the non-human person. 
On this account, it's not membership of the species per se that is not instrumentally valuable. As McMahon also argues, it is difficult to see how this could be morally significant in any way. Rather, what may be understood to ground the non-instrumental value of our membership of the human species is the contingent fact that we as a species have shared a common cultural and biological history with other members of our species in developing the valuable capabilities that we instantiate. If this is coherent, then there may be some basis for reasonable partiality to humanity that might provide us with sufficient moral justification to save a human person rather than a non-human person. However, this partiality provides only very weak reasons. Indeed, it might be claimed that the moral reasons that derive from consideration of the intrinsic properties of beings might be understood to have lexical priority over our reasons of partiality that are grounded in the non-instrumental value of our attachments. McMahon seems to endorse this sort of view. Although he is sceptical about whether membership of the human species can be non-instrumentally valuable, he writes that even if this were the case, it would only justify our doing marginally more for them than other non-human members. And that the baseline for the moral treatment of other species would not be affected by the fact that we have reasonable partiality to human beings. How am I going for time, Tony? Um, you've got two minutes more for half an hour. All right, let me just finish Seven this. Seven minutes more for All right. minutes. All right. It seems that a suitably developed account of this sketch of reasonable partiality could provide a theoretical foundation for an objection to human enhancement that would be superior to that offered by many bioconservatives. However, it would be limited in scope. Um, unlike other objections to human enhancement that appeal to intrinsic value of human nature, this objection from reasonable partiality is not committed to the claim that changing human nature must necessarily involve a change for the worst. The thrust of the objection is that even if changing human nature might in some ways be a change for the better, we can nonetheless have some reasons to refrain from making such changes. On the account of partiality outlined above, the reasons at work here are reasons of partiality grounded in the shared characteristics of our cultural and biological history. However, even if we assume that reasonable partiality is a plausible position, there are many remaining concerns. The first problem is that um, reasons of partiality are weak and lexically inferior to moral reasons generated by moral status considerations. As such, if it can be argued that certain enhancements are necessary to safeguard the moral value of persons, reasons of partiality would not be sufficiently strong to rule them out. Indeed, I've argued that as our technological capabilities continue to expand, there's an increasing probability that a small group of individuals could destroy the human race. And the only way to prevent this from happening is to use technologically, technological means to morally enhance our species. The second problem with partiality-based objections is it's not clear that reasons of partiality to humanity can ground a strong objection that seek to preserve what is valuable about human beings. As I suggested in considering the application of Cohen's conservatism to the human enhancement, it seems plausible to suggest that life extension technologies might not be vulnerable to this sort of objection. As we've previously said, normal ageing brings about the loss of many valuable and valued human capacities, such as the loss of cognitive, sensory, emotional and motor capacities. The preservation of these would require human enhancement. Protecting against normal cognitive decline, normal loss of hearing and sexual potency, normal physical infirmity requires that we enhance human capacities just as we would have to enhance and replace the stonework that ages on a building. So much more needs to be said, I'm concluding, Tony, uh, to justify uh, partiality for humanity. In this short piece, we focused on shared history. But if you think about the clearest case, husband and wife, parent and child, the reasons you would rescue your spouse or your child over some number of strangers are the following. Firstly, their lives literally give meaning to your life. Your hopes, expectations, dreams are entwined with them. They are a part of, in a sense, the extended self. Two, you are dependent on them. You've entered a series of reciprocal cooperative ventures that mean you are together like a crew on a ship. Simon Longstaff called this vulnerability. Three, they generate ways of being for you. Imagine the father who always goes to the soccer with his son and shares the experience with him. If the son dies, he's denied that activity. You need people to invent medicine so you live healthily. In some way, we're all dependent on the family of man. 
maybe not all of the uh, species Homo sapiens, but a large proportion of it. More broadly, I think we can give contractarian or contractualist justifications. We are in a contract with humanity, not with aliens on another planet. Our continued existence and meaning in life, as it is today, for us that matters, is dependent on them in important ways. This, I think, gives some reason to resist radical enhancement in the spirit of Williams and Cohen, but this reason is defeasible. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it, it somewhat reminds me a bit of discuss. So somebody, I mean, Bruce was saying, you know, if you dig up the relatives and, you know, you urinate on them and so on, this is a matter of reverence, you know, uh, or something like that. I mean, what matters in that sort of case is, is, is his feelings as a sort of surviving relative. And, and what matters in these cases is, you know, what the life is going to be like and the relationships we're going to have with it. So in the sense that human beings typically will have, so we will have certain kinds of relationships and be dependent on them in certain ways, that is a relevant consideration. Um, so you know, I, I agree with you, knowing that information is important, but what matters, you know, even in Cohen's terms, is simply, in this personal valuing situation, the relationship that you have to that entity. Uh, now, if the human being is going to be anencephalic or the human being is, is going to have a terminal disease and die very you know, early on in, in gestation, then that's not the sort of person that we're going to have that kind of relationship with. Okay, so it's, so it's more than just the characteristics we need to know, feel like what category to put it into? Well, I think that the, that the point that I'd like to develop in this later is that I think that we... And I think this came up to some, some discussion before, maybe it was Simon's point about in subjectivity. We're dependent on other people f for, you know, essentially our life. Um, we're not dependent on aliens or even, no matter how, you know, incredibly superior they are to us in their capacities. And if it were the case that uh, we started to, to fracture that kind of relationship, that would be like... Um, burning the wedding dress. Uh, it's, it's something that gives meaning to our lives. And I think you know, people are creating apps on your iPhone that you know, give meaning to a lot of people's lives now, today. And, and that, that is something that human beings do, or human persons do. So I'd replace, replace it with persons, but I think that account is roughly correct, that post-persons post or you know, trans-humans or post-humans may not be the kind of beings that we have a relationship with in the same way. And uh, no matter how good they are making computations, uh, I think this, this sort of objection gives some reason to resist that. Russell? Um, so I, mean, I, I agree with everything you say. Um, I agree that moral status has got a trump, whatever value this stuff has. Um, it's hard for me to think of cases where this value is really playing out and doing work in the practical sphere. And um, I'm doing my best here. <laughs> to be concerned. Yeah. No, no, no. I know, I know. But so, like, I mean, so, like, I, I'm trying to also understand how. So, I, I agree. I mean, I was immediately thinking of the things that you said you were talking about in an early paper, which was how do you prevent this species 
what was it, the, the ultimate the, the harm. partiality to humanity, how do you prevent that from collapsing into racism, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. I haven't seen you show that you can prevent it from collapsing, even in the minimal value that you just gave. So like, you know, we would probably want to say, well, it's still wrong to use that partiality to discriminate, even when there's not moral status stuff at stake, just to discriminate based on uh, skin color or gender or something. It just doesn't, that seems wrong. Um, but if that's wrong, then why isn't the general partiality to humanity wrong too? So I, I just didn't see that you could prevent that collapse. My second, can I, uh, can I just answer this one while I think? Yeah, about. sure, sure. So, so I think that's a very good question. I think yeah, Cottingham's sort of analysis yeah. of this is very weak. Yeah. Um, and I didn't go into the sort of weaknesses of it. I, I think, though, what you, you could defend is something like we are, as we are, going to be dependent on human relationships. They don't have to be uh, discriminatory. They don't have to divide up lines according to sex and race. Sure. So we can have a maximally flourishing life without having that, that kind of you know, Ku Klux Klan kind of membership. So in, insofar as you know, it gives us what we need, um, and it also has the, ballot, the benefit of being you know, non-discriminatory, non-prejudiced, egalitarian, whatever you want to put it. Relationships, then, yes. But with just humanity per se, the human category as the defining criteria. No, I don't think, I, I mean, again, I said this and we haven't put this in. This argument will only run no. to a substantial portion of humanity. It won't run to the whole of humanity. What, what, what this needs is, is for a substantial proportion of people to construct enough value amongst themselves. So, you know, we, this is a problem for contractarian view. So how do you draw, where do you draw the, the line on the contract? And the idea that it has to be at the level of the whole of humanity yeah. seems to have some sort of cosmic direction. Okay, so can I just quickly ask my second question? Is that okay? Very good. So my, my second question was, we talk about the, you know, the, the value of, of, of being a human being per se, uh, as separate from the whole of the moral status issues which relates to personhood and subjective properties and whatever else. Um, but what are we talking about? I mean, a biological category as defined by, like, uh, you know, contemporary biologists of how we're defining species? Yeah, so, so functional you're category? exactly right. So that, that point, I, you're, so what I suggest you do is you replace human being yes. in their arguments by, with person. That's, okay. And then you get around that. Yeah, that yeah, yeah. Just one thing on your earlier point about not collapsing into yeah. racism, genderism, I, I couldn't follow that at all. I mean, uh, Partiality towards humanity includes being partial towards black people and women and so on. They're all part of humanity. But I mean, it strengthens the objection to racism and so on. Well, right. But I mean, the question is, if, if you want to use the species category as a, as a locus of value, whatever that value is, yeah. why not say because, well, we're all human, we share a history, we share a culture, whatever. Mm -hmm. You can make the exact same set of arguments in relation to races, in relation to genders, in relation to, you know, the same, yeah, same types of considerations. I mean, the, the argument that Williams is presenting is that, yeah. that there's a special partiality that we humans owe to all human beings. And that can't collapse into gender and racist stuff by itself. No, but Russell well, where that value is coming no, from is what I'm asking. But then, yeah, 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 that's the further point. But, no, but, yeah, but, the, but the actual point about... But the weakness, sorry, in, no, but the weakness in Williams's view is exactly as Russell says. He, he picks up, you know, you've got 46 chromosomes. Right. Well, if you can pick that, why can't you pick sex? What's, what's special about yeah. 46 chromosomes? I took it he was uh, something... That's human. what the biological kind yeah, of category is. I'm abusing my position as chair of this book, but I took it that he wasn't, <laughs> that he wasn't doing it in those purely biological terms. Well, he's but, appealing but to the species, homo yeah, sapiens, yeah, yeah, however he defines his biological yeah, definition. But he's treating species here as a quasi-historical term relating to this, this kind. No, no, he's attacking people's view on persons. It's to talk about natural kinds, not to talk about... Uh, in the philosophical sense, not at all. Racism can be historical kinds too, so I mean, this is not, it's not going to yeah, help yeah, us. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, there's, but I, I don't think I should go on anymore, though. No. <laughs> um, I just wanted to follow up on Justin's point, uh, or on your reply to it. So, um, I think your point that what matters about discovering that when you live in jail, it's not a cat, it's an anchor for child's life. It's not just how it affects me or my relations. So, for example, if you think of something like Thomas Barrow's um, deprivation in terms of, I can feel pity, for example, for a child that is an um, even though I have no personal relation to that child, might be a complete stranger. And it seems to me the, the reason that 
why I feel pity or some, something like that, or commiseration or so forth, is because I can see what that child is deprived of, or what if it had been a healthy, normal born child, it might have achieved. And the reason why I don't pity the cat for being a cat is because I have certain expectations of what a cat can do, and if it's a healthy cat, well, you know, that's great. So there is more invested than just personal relationship. There is something else that I can see that the other is deprived of or can gain for, you know, have joy for someone. So I think to just bring everything down to personal relations in that sense misses other bits that I'm not accounted for. Yeah, look, I completely agree. I don't think that's the only... Uh... I mean, I, I'm trying to reconstruct some, someone else's arguments. But uh, uh, just on one point about the... Uh, I mean, I've appealed to sort of intuitions and, and reactions to these sorts of cases, but I think they, they also have some limit. Um, and in the case of pity, you know, what do you think about a child who has uh, trisomy 18? It's got three chromosomes of 18 very severely intellectually disabled, typically lives, dies early in childhood, a few live to the age of 10. Do you, do you pity, um, so say you, you know, if your friend has a pregnancy diagnosed with trisomy 18, do you pity that child? Well, if you remove the extra chromosome, you'll have a different individual um, in that case. Uh, it won't be, it'll be, be psychologically so different to the child who would be born with trisomy 18 with you know, an IQ of 30 or 20 or something. Uh, so it's not clear that the fact that you pity um, the anencephalic is a reason to say there's something special about that particular case. Now, it kind of, you know, as our moral emotions and reactions are not really targeted to the important moral considerations. In the case of the trisomy 18, there are arguments about personal identity that will ground what your reactions to that in the interests of that individual are. And you, you, can't, you can't look to whether you pity or not, or you happen to have that reaction. So I'm not sure how, how much our pitying, finding out that you've got an anencephalic child is gonna tell us about the about the morality of the situation, the ethics of the situation. Well, uh, all I wanted, that might be tangential. No, no, all I wanted to say is that the point that uh, Justin made was a generic one that actually, that you know the context, you know, bef before and after the veil, adds something considerable to your, to your evaluation of the situation. And all I was trying to make a point is that your relation um, is not the only thing that matters in that, that context. There's also, there are other things than your personal relation or even the specific relations that yep. matter. I, and I, the example of Pippi simply exemplifies. I guess, I, guess, I guess that's what, you know, what I was saying with Russell, that actually what matters is lexically superior is whether you have a being with moral status, that is a person, that's what really matters. And um, that's what I was trying to get at with Justin. What really matters is not that you find out it's a human being or it could have been a human being. It's that it could have been a person uh, that matters. Is, is, the sort of, is the moral currency here, not human being. Current is a good make, it, make it a bit quick. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, when, when does a um, person in the future, or when, when do transhumans cease to be the persons that we have reasons to care about? Um, so Williams finishes with this sort of, uh, I think it's, it's not Battlestar Galactica, yeah, Independence Day, this uh, Independence Day scenario where it's, you know, super powerful aliens come to the, and he has this sort of story, you know, incredibly much, you know, tr post humans that come down to the earth and, and they can run, he claims in this case, in this version, they can run the earth a lot better than us. Um, and he, you know, he asks, you know, what, what, how should we view this situation? Um, and I, I think that, you know, my response to him in that piece was, well, it depends. You know, if they actually treat us well, <laughs> respect our rights, and run the planet really well, we should embrace their arrival. Um, so whether we, 
whether we can have relationships with, with post-humans and how they treat us is not something that just comes out of the fact that they're post-humans, unless you think they're morally enhanced post-humans who will necessarily... So there needn't be a war of post-human versus human. Um, in fact, you know, that's... If they, if in, as in the actual Independence Day scenario, if they do attack and try to take over the world, we shouldn't just give in to them as William suggests we should because they're better than us. We should fight <laughs> because it doesn't matter to us that they're better than us. It's our lives and we have a right to protect our own lives. So it depends on the relationship that actually you know, is occurring. Um, so I think, again, it's interesting that even somebody like Bernard Williams gets sort of, I think, get very anxious about these um, prospects. He poses the question, doesn't he, whose side are you on, which we've heard quite recently from uh, another quarter. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to thank you.